Frontline is a presentation of the Documentary Consortium. In South Africa, there's hope of a political settlement with a promise of elections and a new democratic government. Tonight, the story of what happened in the three years since Nelson Mandela's release from prison. Three years of violent confrontations. Stalled negotiations. Police brutality. And massive protests. We want peace standing on our feet not kneeling on our knees. The story of a country trying to reinvent itself and the passing of the old order. Tonight, Apartheid's Last Stand. With funding provided by the financial support of viewers like you. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Frontline. South Africa is waking to the promise of a new start. These days there's talk of hope, of the chance to escape poverty, and of a political settlement to end the long years of apartheid. The optimists are already learning a new language, the language of the ballot box. No parent, no husband can stop you from voting if you want to. Oh. That is within your rights. Mm -hmm. All you need to qualify to vote is to be 18 years old and above. Oh. And have a South African ID <coughs> and be a South African citizen. Knowledge is the best and most powerful weapon. Oh, yeah. That is why we have already started teaching people how to vote. These elections are totally different from those... A troop of actors tours the townships, explaining to audiences what millions outside South Africa take for granted the meaning of the vote. Sir, has this thing of voting and elections got anything to do with democracy? Yes, it has got something to do with democracy. But first, can somebody tell me what is democracy? Yes. 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 Oh, come, come again, come, come again. Uh, democracy is the government of the people, for the people, by the people. The people have put their hopes in one man, Nelson Mandela and his African National Congress. For three years, he's been negotiating on their behalf with the white government. He now has to persuade his most militant supporters to accept a compromise with power. There can never be coexistence between liberation and apartheid, between Comrade Nelson Mandela and Ditlek, one must lose, one must de be defeated, and that is Ditlek. President F.W. de Klerk also has to sell a deal to his people. The man given the credit for breaking with 300 years of white rule has to reassure his followers that he hasn't given away too much and that while he is relinquishing absolute power, he will find a way to protect them. We do not ask for minority, continued minority domination. But we say that a system within which with 51% of the vote, you have 100% of the power is not the right system for South Africa. De Klerk's National Party created the policy of apartheid. De Klerk has always been a party man. His father was in the cabinet and his uncle was prime minister. But de Klerk has never acknowledged that apartheid was fundamentally immoral. He's only expressed regrets for some of its effects. He personally, as far as he's concerned, was never involved in anything that dehumanized people. He sees himself not as an inheritor of an evil system. He sees himself as a liquidator of, of, of everything that didn't work. And therefore, when he apologizes, he apologizes for inadvertent uh, hurt 
uh, and dehumanizing. Uh, he, he is not part of that. In his, in his guts, he is not part of that. In the 80s, as the government of P.W. Boerter was losing control, de Klerk became party leader, backed by the party's conservative wing. I think he is a sort of more of a realist and less of an ideologue than some of the others. And I'm prepared to say there was no conversion in the clerk's case. I mean, all this Damascus experience and things like that, I don't think that was the case. I think what happened is that in the middle of the 80s, and there was 88, especially the, the state of the economy, this economy was in a mess. It's still in a mess. That message got through to the politicians. He called in business leaders to tell him about the economy, what they thought was important. And what they said was that if sanctions go on, uh, there ain't going to be no economy in a year or so. He then went to visit uh, foreign heads of state um, to ask about the sanctions, whether they could do anything. And they said that they couldn't do anything further. In fact, they couldn't go on holding sanctions where they were, unless he demolished apartheid. De Klerk's strategy was a bold one. To release Mandela and legalize the ANC. It was an act that caught the world's imagination, but his words were cautious. We approach this meeting profoundly aware of our responsibilities to all the people of South Africa. It provides the opportunity for another important and constructive step in the irreversible process of normalization, which has already started. Mandela and the ANC had played their part. For years, he'd been writing to the government from prison and even meeting with the leadership, persuading them that the ANC was not the threat they feared. At the same time, exiles like Tabo and Becky had been negotiating outside the country with senior government officials. At this first official meeting in 1990, there was great optimism, encouraged by what was seen as a special relationship between de Klerk and Mandela. It was an eye-opener to all those who took part. That uh, meeting left its mark and influenced the views both of uh, the government and ourselves on the whole question of negotiations, how it should be handled. And all this uh, aroused expectations on the part of the public, both black and white, that uh, would soon have a breakthrough. But how far was de Klerk prepared to go to embrace real change? He'd set himself an extraordinary task to change the direction of his party and his people and at the same time to protect them. He was promising reform, but he brought no new faces into his inner circle, relying instead on the familiar members of the white Afrikaner establishment. Clark and his government have become spoiled by being in power for such a long period. He and his whole government's approach is one of, yes, we want to reform because we have no choice to reform, but uh, uh, the whole approach is that, uh, well, we will try to outwit the ANC. Allow them to make mistakes, allow them to, 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 to explode the myths which were built up around them with the hope that if there is an election, somewhere down the road, two or three years or even four years, then the ANC would not have that sort of standing internationally and also nationally to be a major political threat so to there the was establishment. An, so there was an idea that, that, was definitely that the that process idea. should be delayed? I have no doubt about that. They hoped that uh, uh, the release of a Mandela, for instance, would, would serve to, to demystify him. Once you let him loose in the streets, uh, he wouldn't deliver what people expected he could deliver the following day after his release, uh, that he would make mistakes, uh, and therefore that in the end you would be dealing with a person who's a little bit more human uh, than, than he seemed to be when he was in prison. 
Perhaps the most painful problem Mandela would face came soon after his release. A bloody political war among Zulus in Natal had claimed thousands of lives. He appealed for peace. My message to those of you involved in this battle of brother against brother is this. Take your guns, your knives, and your pangas, and throw them into the sea. It was not a message his supporters wanted to hear. They had lived through five years of fighting while Mandela was still in prison, and they were convinced that to put down their arms now would be suicidal. Their opponents were more traditional Zulus, many from the rural areas of the so-called homeland of KwaZulu. For Pretoria, their leader, Chief Mangasutu Butelezi, was a natural ally. At the time of Mandela's release, de Klerk's government paid secret funds into his Inkata movement, fueling rivalries in Natal and exploiting Butelezi's antagonism to the ANC. It seems ironic that people talk of peace and democracy when their, in, their behavior indicates the opposite. We see our people being killed not in face-to-face -face combat, which King Shara taught our people. We see people being attacked in their homes when they are asleep at the dead of night. Butelezi turned Inkata into a national political party to make an impact beyond his region. In the months that followed, the political battle spread from Natal to the black townships around Johannesburg. Beginning in July of 1990, there was a spate of murders on the township commuter trains. Mysterious attackers would arrive at a station, open fire on commuters, and disappear. The police had no answers, but locals had little doubt where the attacks came from. Hostels for migrant workers house mainly single men, many of them Zulus from Natal. Inkata has many recruits here, one resident explained how hostile leaders organized train attacks. At Nansfield Station early one morning, those selected joined the crowd waiting for the train to Johannesburg and carried out their orders. On this one occasion, 13 people were killed and more than 30 wounded. Over time, there would be almost 400 deaths, but until recently, not a single prosecution. Township residents had their own ideas about who to blame and were ready to take revenge. 
The song is an insult to Butelezi. Hostile residents were prepared to retaliate in turn, threatening the peace process almost before it had got off the ground. It was against this background in August 1990 that de Klerk and Mandela came to Pretoria for their second formal meeting. To get the negotiation process moving, the ANC was ready with a major concession to suspend all operations against the state by its underground guerrilla army. We came to this meeting already having decided that uh, we will declare a ceasefire with immediate effect. So we have made a very significant concession. But this concession was apparently no surprise to the government. Just two weeks before the meeting, one of the ANC's most senior negotiators, who was carrying ANC documents, had been arrested. My chief interrogator, in fact, the head of the security branch, General Bassi Smith, saw me at my request, because in my briefcase was the resolution mandating the NEC delegation as to what positions they should take at the forthcoming Pretoria meeting. And I drew his attention that he was using that information improperly, that if they were genuinely committed to the negotiation process, that information was not meant to be transmitted to the ministers. He made no bones about it, that it had given them an advantage. And he went further, actually foreshadowing that the, while I was in detention, violence swept through this country. He said to me, we have now got you people by the shorties. The violence that is going to hit this country is going to be seen as attributable to you people. The only solution is to go and evict those people from that hostel. Yeah. ANC supporters did launch attacks on hostels. General Barsi Smith denied Maharaja's story and the government denied it was involved in fomenting the violence. But with the confrontations came firearms. It wasn't clear where they were coming from. The effect of residents taking matters into their own hands was devastating. ANC leaders were seen as neither able to protect their people nor to discipline them. The portrayal of violence on South African television was further damaging to the ANC's image. Uh, three weeks, things have escalated uh, to an extent that it's completely unacceptable. Clearly the ANC, who perceived the... the, the but in Carter's own role has been brought into question by this man, once a spokesman for the party. In Alexander, it appears that they have launched a revolutionary war against our people. Bruce Anderson was an Inkata delegate at talks with the government. Zulu peoples or Inkata members, and you know, really, we don't want to see this thing blow up. Anderson is now disowned by Inkata because he claims that the security forces collaborated in the violence. The ANC have, have uh, quite a number of arms caches scattered around. For, we, we know, or we try to find out where these arms caches are. We would then report that to, to the security police. The security police would go and raid the place, uh, capture the arms. Sometimes the whole amount of the arms would be handed over to us. Uh, sometimes a portion of the arms would be handed over to us. But I know of that happening on numerous occasions, and I, I've certainly heard it discussed openly. So Encarta has a, a free supply of weaponry provided by the South African police? Um, by sections of the South African police. Uh, I think I think if you try to say all the, the SAP are handing over, over weapons sort of willy-nilly to Encarta, no, that's not the truth. Anderson claims the police helped Encarta in other ways. When they raided the townships for arms, the hostels were tipped off. There were a number of raids on Alex that, in fact, no weapons were found at all. 
when there were weapons there <laughs> at six o'clock in the evening, but when the raid went on, there were no weapons. The weapons were taken out because we knew specifically that there, were, that there was going to be a raid. How senior are these officers? Hmm, we're talking about very senior officers. We're talking about very, very senior officers. Brigadier, Colonel, that sort of thing. How actively were the security forces encouraging the violence? No other issue would have as great an effect over de Klerk's so-called special relationship with Mandela. De Klerk's failure to investigate thoroughly charges against the police confirmed ANC suspicions about a third force. Senior officers working with or without government approval but certainly protected by de Klerk because he couldn't afford to lose their support. I'm talking about a small number of people who against orders, against the policy, are doing it as an own initiative and we want to stamp that out. But the security forces per se are clean and uh, this concept that, that there's a big third force and there's a big cabal is simply no evidence to substantiate that there isn't such a thing. But under de Klerk, there was evidence of military interference in other political events. In the Siskai, one of the so-called independent homelands created under apartheid, a new leader had come to power. But to the government's dismay, Brigadier Opar Gozo seemed supportive of the ANC. He even appeared on a platform with Mandela. So military intelligence in Pretoria set out to turn Gozor against Mandela by telling him he was the target of ANC assassination plots. An intelligence briefing prepared for him as late as November 1992 said, the ANC do not believe in negotiations to solve the problems in the region. For them, there is only one solution. Brigadier Gozor and his supporters must either be killed or chased out of the region. A former colonel in South African military intelligence saw all this happening. Colonel Gert Hugo transferred to the Siskai to head their military intelligence. This was an undercover military operation that they made him paranoid about his own safety. They fabricated threats against his life on a daily, weekly basis. It was a, it was a the, the standing joke was that on Friday, you know, you just say they are coming. They being from Contour with Siswe out of the trans sky. It was going to be a launch attack on Gorzal's life. And Contour with Siswe is the ANC's guerrilla army. Yes, of course, it is clear and evident that they've been trying to dodge. Yeah. To seal his allegiance, military intelligence, according to Hugo, set up two former government officials to cross the border from neighboring Transkai. They fed him with information that people under the previous regime that wants to come back to power is planning a coup in conjunction again with the Transkai. The two people came in and one of them was summarily executed on the spot. They just shot the car to pieces. One got away and was later on executed in the nearby village by the military on orders from Gorzal because this was the final proof to Gorzal that these threats that was pumped into him the whole time were true. I had no illusions that uh, what these people were saying was, well, was right. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't take it as manipulation because there were evidence. There has been a wrong uh, impression created to people that we are puppets and little boys of Pretoria. We are not. We are independent and we are sovereign. It was no secret that the ANC wanted to get rid of the government's allies, homeland leaders like Gozor. But the political battle between Gozor's forces and the local ANC was fueled by the Dirty Tricks campaign. About 1,500 tomorrow afternoon. Is this an attempt to derail the peace process? I wouldn't say it's an attempt to derail the peace process. I would, say, I would say it's a strategy to prolong the negotiated, negotiation process to, in the end, to negotiate the, the best bargain for a small handful of individuals. 
Then who's giving the orders for things to continue? I believe it's a discipline within the military. There's two scenarios. Either the politicians have to accept the fact that the security forces are out of control and not listening, or disciplines within the security forces are not in tandem with the reform initiatives. That's the one they have to accept. If they don't accept that, they have to acknowledge that they are part and parcel of the hidden agenda. The facts of the case is things keep on happening. Suspicion about a hidden agenda was reinforced when de Klerk set aside a hundred-year-old law banning the carrying of so-called Zulu cultural weapons. Mandela was outraged. When de Klerk changed the law and made it legal for people to carry weapons, these weapons of death, it was the act of a white person who regards the lives of blacks as uh, worthless. That changed the whole situation completely uh, from the point of view of the mutual trust we've been trying to build uh, between uh, the African National Congress and the National Party. I happened to be in his office when this was happening and, uh, and Nelson Mandela had just made a, a statement uh, attacking him for having signed it. And he was so utterly upset about that and said, now I have signed something to make uh, the carrying of weapons illegal. And he, he was so, so, it, lo it looked absolutely genuine. He was really upset about that. Um, I think he signed that bill without knowing what was in it. Um, I, I believe there could have been a little bit of internal sabotage. But once he realized what he'd done, why didn't he reverse it? <laughs> that, that's the, 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 the puzzle. About, about him, there are a, a few things like that where um, you wonder why he doesn't take action. After February 2nd, 1990, could President de Klerk have stopped the security force dirty tricks? He could have done more. The lack of, for example, putting out a date saying after this date, no indemnity will be considered in my mind, is, is he is allowing a situation to continue which suits the politicians, and that is prolonging the negotiation process. No, not anywhere has a clear-cut message been given, stop, stop your activities, in the form of saying, after this date, no indemnity will be considered. Despite the violence, the negotiation process was moving forward. In December 1991, the first multi-party congress opened, the Convention for a Democratic South Africa. Outside, right-wing white protesters called de Klerk a traitor, fearful of what the government might have already conceded. It was almost two years since de Klerk had set the whole process in train. Nearly 20 groups were represented at the table dividing almost equally behind the government and the ANC. The task was to devise a form of transitional government to help South Africa move from white minority rule to real democracy. The delegates would take their cue from the readiness of the leaders to compromise. I believe that the chemistry of the individuals is an important factor. But more important is whether the individuals arranged around that table are or in a problem-solving frame of mind or whether they are in a, a party political platform to extract gains. The event was supposed to have been largely ceremonial, so no one was expecting what would happen when de Klerk made what was billed as the last speech of the day. There is only one party sitting in this room with a private army and with arms caches, illegal arms caches, admitting to it. All the other parties do not have a dualism. We believe one cannot be totally committed, totally committed to peaceful solutions if your major speakers constantly 
until two weeks ago from certain platforms with arms caches make an appeal for the struggle to continue and adhere to the concept of armed action. Outraged at the attack, Mandela asked for the microphone. If a man can come to a conference of this nature and pay, play the type of politics which are contained in his paper, very few people would like her to deal with such a man. There are two stories about why this happened. One says de Klerk thought Mandela had been warned that he was going to make a public attack on the ANC's military wing to appease his white constituents, and that the message had not been given to Mandela. The other says de Klerk broke a private agreement. It confirms what we have been saying all along, that the National Party and the government have a double agenda. They are talking peace to us. They are at the same time conducting a war. If a head of the government doesn't know about it, then he is not fit to be a head of a government. Whatever had happened behind the scenes, the clash left a public perception of a profound divide between the ANC and the government at the very start of formal negotiations. I think the, the Clark Mandela confrontation illustrates in a way some of the miracles of negotiation in the last three years. Time and again this confrontation breaks down deadlocks and the train moves because there is no alternative. And the remarkable thing is that in terms of the decisions taken by Kudesa one, notwithstanding the confrontation, four weeks later, right on time, the first preparatory meeting started and the whole process got underway. But the private special relationship was damaged further, as publicly de Klerk held to his tough line, playing to his own constituents. Negotiations are not going to be easy. And I raised the fundamental issue, and it will have to be cleared, and there's only one way to clear it, and that is through negotiation, and that is what we intend to do. He believes he has to deliver a deal that is acceptable to the mainstream white population. That if that does not happen, there will be a revolt, and that it is not a particularly um, Afrikaner, we are stands the way hung, the ultra-right inspired revolt, but a mainstream revolt. You! You! Yes, you! Don't look around, I'm talking to you! Did you vote yes today? Suddenly, de Klerk called a white referendum. He was losing some mainstream white support to the growing right wing. Deal. Well, what's his excuse? However unsubtle, it was an expensive campaign by South African standards, okay. with millions from big business. If friends or colleagues have forgotten that the referendum is on today, please remind them to vote yes. De Klerk ran his campaign like an American presidential candidate. He was asking the white electorate to give him a mandate to negotiate their future with the ANC. He knew he had popular support, but until the last minute, his advisers put out the story that it was too close to call. Dames and heren, the uitslag met twee streke... When the votes were counted, he'd won by 68% to 32. It was a political triumph. The referendum which was a astounding sort of victory, also strengthened the mood among the white population. And listen, we have some interests, vested interests. We regard the clerk as the guardian of our interests. And we have now given him this vote of confidence. Now we expect him to deliver. This tough line immediately after the, the referendum was perhaps one of his most serious mistakes. He completely, he and his advisors completely misinterpreted the referendum as if it was not only the whites, 
but the total population that gave him a 70% support. I'm told that the Monday after the referendum, the attitude of the National Party negotiators at Kudesa II was completely different. The old arrogance so typical of the National Party was back again. We couldn't even agree on the composition of the daily management committee of Kodesa. We couldn't agree on the appointment of the next chairperson because government took the position, ANC, I don't have to discuss with you. I don't have to come to any common understanding on this problem. I will meet my allies, the IFP, Bobotswana, etc., and you have to take it or leave it. But by now, the working groups at Kadesa had already developed the outlines of a negotiated settlement. There'd be elections leading to an interim government. De Klerk's side had conceded that an elected body should write the constitution. The ANC agreed to include de Klerk's party in a coalition. But when the government introduced a new percentage needed to approve a constitution, the talks collapsed. Each side blamed the other. Looking back at it, I would rather say the question of the percentages was, uh, was used to a certain extent as the, as the reason to call off talks by the ANC. Primarily, I think in the, in the background was the fact that things went too smooth from the government's point of view for them and that they for, felt that, uh, that things should actually be stalled for that purpose. My own impression is somewhat different. In many discussions with some of the, ANC, uh, of the government negotiators, ministers, MPs, it became very clear in the last two weeks before Kodesa II took place in the middle of May that the government had no intention that Kodesa II must take final decisions. In private discussions they were talking of there must be another follow-up in August, September. Others spoke of there will be Kodesa III, IV, and V. And they openly spoke of at least a year before Kodesa could finally make decisions to prepare the way ahead. But tragedy would once more intervene. One night at a place called Boy Patong, more than 200 armed men entered a squatter camp. They came into, into the room where I and Myra were lying. We were hiding under the bed. So they just came in and opened the bed and stabbed my mother with a, with a spear. 46 people, mostly women and children, were brutally killed. The attackers were identified as Inkata supporters from the nearby hostel. Then de Klerk came to Boipatong, but his gesture of sympathy was met only with anger. An hour after de Klerk left, the police opened fire. Then an officer shouted in Afrikaans, who told you to shoot? Then, no one gave the order to shoot. When Mandela came to Boy Patong a few days later, it was clear that the people were not interested in any more talking. The negotiation process is completely in tatter. I can no longer explain to our people why we continue to talk to a government, to a regime which is murdering our people 
his method of bringing about a solution in this country is war. We are going to respond to that. This was Mandela's referendum. The ANC campaign of mass action brought him to the steps of the capital in Pretoria. The government must now accept that we want peace standing on our feet, not kneeling on our knees. The ANC... De Klerk was in his office above. It was clear that the ANC had not been as weakened over the past few years as the government believed. I think not just the government, but also white people in this country got the following message from mass action. The ANC alliance has the ability to mobilize people and uh, get them on the streets. And secondly, they have the ability to destroy the economy and to disrupt normal sort of services. And everyone uh, uh, looking realistically at the country must accept that if we can't straighten out the economy, then no democratization will in any case uh, succeed in the country. Big business had pushed de Klerk into reform from the beginning. Now his new finance minister, Johannesburg businessman Derek Keyes, sounded the alarm. Which have been there for a long time, but which can no longer be avoided. He laid out the consequences of further delays in reaching a political settlement. Privately, he briefed Mandela and the ANC leadership. Could reach 7% in the current fiscal year. I think it was a presentation that was truly devastating because it brought home the fact that this economy is actually in danger of entering into a downward spiral. And those who have studied economics to any superficial degree realize that once you're in that spiral, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to pull out. It's a very big change uh, for the ANC, which had adhered to the principle of Phoenix rising from the ashes and citing Japan and Germany as examples um, as recently as a year ago, for instance. Uh, I believe that it now has sunk in that this isn't the case, that they will not be rectify the situation once they are in power. There was an urgent need to come together but the legacy of two and a half years of confrontation would lead to one more tragedy. The ANC wanted to challenge government-allied homeland leaders on their own ground. They set out to march to the Siskai, guarded by Brigadier Gozo's troops. The ANC leaders had a court order restricting their protest to a football stadium. They believed the Siskai soldiers were no threat. We were all convinced that uh, they were demoralized, that they would not shoot at their own people because they had relatives amongst those people who marched there and that they would not accept orders, you know, to mow down people who were not, you know, fighting and carrying weapons. Suddenly, a group of militant ANC officials led a charge towards the capital, Bishu. <laughs> Inevitably, forces in the South African military were blamed. Why didn't the SADF intervene the day of the march? Why weren't the SADF troops deployed on the ground, knowing the track record of the Siskai Defence Force being a Mickey Mouse rabble that will shoot if they, if they feel threatened? In my mind, there's no doubt that this was to be used as an example for the Progressive Alliance. Stop your nonsense. This is the way we will act against you. If the government had a part in this, how could the ANC keep talking to them? But where had the ANC led its people? Zeno 
and without talking, where might it all end? We hate the clock. We hate apartheid. We hate capitalism. And we shall continue doing that, so, that until we defeat this government. The ANC is not fighting for power sharing. When we fight against Bozo, we are doing so because we don't want to share power with him. We are fighting against the clock because we don't want to share power with him. People cannot share power with the enemy. The enemy must be crushed. Who now? Who like? Who? Come on, son. Who now? Get up. Hey, my man. Hey, my man. Hey, my man. Hey, my man. How many more confrontations would there be between protesters and soldiers? It was as if people sort of looked into the abyss and said, listen, this is where things will take us if we don't develop a, a, a strategy to compromise and to cooperate and establish a, 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 a culture of cooperation. And this uh, looking into the abyss played a major role in bringing the Clark and Mandela together. It is no longer possible to say that the responsibility for violence was uh, caused by this particular organization or by the security forces alone. We are now all involved. And the important thing is not uh, uh, to blame uh, one another. The important thing is to work out strategy as to how to address the question of violence. Yeah. As they met in September 1992, it was clear to both sides that they had to establish an interim government as soon as possible. The pressure was on de Klerk not just to clean up his security forces, but to agree to joint control of them with the ANC. He had to break the negotiation deadlock. The whole mood in the country, down at ground level, is that people are getting disillusioned with political leaders because of the lack of progress which is being made. And all political leaders are feeling this pressure. And hopefully that will have a positive effect. It had been three years since de Klerk had promised his white supporters that he would lead them safely through great changes. The old order still seemed intact, but behind the scenes, government and ANC negotiators were agreeing to create a coalition government for a limited period of five years. In early 1993, de Klerk presided over the last white parliament. government has a clear mandate for the constitutional model towards which it is working. Power sharing, strong regional government and checks and balances to prevent... The phrases were familiar and reassuring, but de Klerk had been forced to settle for less than he'd hoped. Still, he'd persuaded the ANC to accept a form of federalism, but he had no white veto. And now he had to keep his bargain to bring the security forces under joint control in an ANC majority government. The simple truth is that a devastating war will ensue if negotiation does not succeed. There is already in this country an incipient counter-revolutionary onslaught. And uh, nobody can guarantee that uh, that onslaught will not continue and be strengthened when a democratic government has taken over power. And the best thing, the best strategy to adopt, therefore, is to ensure that we pool the resources of all political parties which believe in a non-racial democracy. The National Party has declared in favor of a non-racial democracy, and uh, we must accept that uh, that is what they want. And therefore, it's natural, at least for the, five, for the first three to five years, 
to have a government of national unity. Not everyone was pleased with the news. The idea that the ANC and the government could work out a deal without him infuriated the head of Encarta. Butelezi wanted to be treated as a major player in the future government. We don't question the right of any party, including the ANC, to have any discussion with the government. But we resent that any party with the government should reach an understanding and make a decision which impacts on the rest of South Africans without any representation of the rest of us. That is the crux of this demonstration. Butelezi still has to prove his support beyond his regional base in an election. And in Natal, his bitter war with the ANC will not be easily set aside. But both the ANC and the government know they have to bring him into the process. Three years ago, de Klerk may have believed he could outmaneuver Mandela and the ANC, split their ranks, and even retain power. Now he's had to accept that genuine cooperation with Mandela and his ANC is the only hope for South Africa. The man he released from prison has never wavered in his readiness to share the future with whites. Now he expects de Klerk to help him keep the country together. Soon de Klerk will find himself fighting for a new constituency in the first democratic elections. The man who rightly claims to have closed the book on apartheid will have to live with its legacy. And have to accept whatever power he can win from the ballot box. For Mandela, the problem will not be winning an election. It will be the expectations that come with victory. And how much he can deliver beyond hope. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to demonstrate to you how to go about with voting. My sister here is going to demonstrate for us. I am an ID checker. I check whether the face that is on an ID corresponds with that of an ID holder. I also check whether she or he is a South African citizen. In a hall in a township, people line up to learn how to vote. The song says it's time for elections, time for Africans of all races to choose our leaders and to be governed with love.
Funding for Frontline is provided by the financial support of viewers like you and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content.